I, I don't want to get into the frequency domain right now because I haven't introduced it. But there will be limitation, right? Sir? Obviously, I mean, when you are trying to get V1 minus V2 through different paths, V1 will not be equal to exactly V1 when it reaches the output, right? So, so there will be. Yes, sir, another thing that you have mentioned that when we are closing the loop, like right, when we are connecting the output and VV, yeah. that time the impedance at various nodes reduces. Right. And that basically, um, uh, I mean, stabilize the uh, overall yeah. system. So can you give a little, little bit more insight on how it is getting stabilized uh, due to... It's basically, yeah, okay, so... So let me ask to the broader class, right? So this is actually a very important question. I I, I try to allude to it in multiple uh, last lectures also. So his question is, if you put this thing in negative feedback, right? So let's put this thing in negative feedback. And let's consider only incremental cases, right? So incremental cases, so this, this is grounded. So do you find any node here which is uh, high impedance node. You have how many nodes? You have one, two, three, four, five, right? So are, are there any nodes which are high impedance nodes? No, right, you are driving it with a short. Right. right? Are there any other high impedance nodes in the circuit? Yeah, simulating for one also grounded, right? Yeah, that is that is VDD. Anybody? Yes, no. Need an answer. Three. Okay. Is three a high impedance node? So if you push in current at the incremental current at three. Or rather, I mean, yeah. So if you if you apply a tail voltage at three, it won't be right. So you have this path here, right? low impedance path. So, uh, so this is not particular to this, but to this defam. It's, it should be uh, it's it it's uh, relevant to any feedback network because a feedback network is supposed to be robust to excursions. It's supposed to be robust to any anything that you are injecting. So if you inject high impedance node means if you inject a current, it should it will swing a lot. So that goes against even the very definition of robustness. So if feedback negative feedback is supposed to make your system robust, which means immune to change of uh, immune to change of any any unwanted injection, which means you should not have any high impedance node by default. Okay, make sense. Does that answer your question? Sir, why you are saying only current, like because that is dependent current source? Uh, okay, so what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean by why I'm saying current? You are, if you if you inject voltage, you can get high current. Is that what uh, you're saying? Uh, yes, you can because we are all. I mean, we are stabilizing in the voltage domain. So so that's that's a good question. So whatever we are doing till now, we are assuming my output is voltage, input is voltage, right? And current is is the under the hood phenomena that is happening. So you can derive everything uh, and flip it around, right? We want to, my signals in and out are all currents and under the hood is voltage, basically do all of this. So if you get another device, which is current control voltage source, right? So basically this is, you basically whatever is you have in MOSFET, you flip it, make the dual of it. Whatever is voltage control, make it current control. Whatever is current control, make it voltage control. And then deal with everything in, in current, current domain. Then the requirement will be different. Then you don't want currents to get limited. Right? So it's basically boils down to the fact that what is your limiting, limited by. So, okay. So another way of thinking about it is that in all these circuits, there is a limitation of the amount of, of the voltage supplies. There is a VDD higher limit, lower limit ground. So you'll have to ensure that the voltage excursion stays between them, whatever happens. If you don't ensure that, then you are in trouble, your circuit is not working. But there is, in principle, no current limit. Isn't it? It's not as if we have done anything which says that we can only support this much incremental current. 
right? There is, in essence, no current limit. So this, uh, I mean, one might say that these are current limited because of I naught, because no no part of the circuit can carry current more than I naught because of this. Yeah, to some extent that is true, but I can increase that. I can change that because I can increase I naught also without affecting my voltage limits conditions. So these circuits are essentially voltage limited. So that's why we have this condition of high impedance node not being allowed. If you get into a case a circuit design which is current limited, where you can have any voltage, but you, I mean your current maximum current that you can draw is limited, then all the conditions flip. Fundamentally, nothing changes because KCL and KVL are dual of each other. In one case, you are going around adding the voltage, other cases you are adding the currents. In mathematically, there is nothing changed. I mean, you give it to a simulator, it doesn't know what is current voltage numbers, matrix is same. So nothing is nothing changes as far as the calculations are concerned, but so we we would like to look at it from a more intuitive physical uh, from the physical aspect of it, there is some change that is you, you go from current to voltage. But whatever you are, whatever you are considering in, in a voltage domain will get essentially get flipped. Whatever is limited in the voltage domain will get limited in the current domain, and so on and so forth. So you will have current limits. The last question. Yes. Uh, so sir, uh, when we had open loop case, in that case, we determine the value of the bias voltage as both the transistor M1 and F2, maximum and minimum voltage. Okay. So when we are closing the loop, yeah. How that the limit will change? Yeah, yeah, that's a part of this this year, this this, this today's lecture. Oh. Sir, yes. Huh. Why well, don't understand the question? I mean, you take the output at node two, whatever the voltage is supposed to be at node three, it will be. I I maybe you are asking something different. I'm not getting it. Can you be more precise? Open. What is open? Incrementally, the current source will open. Sure. Yeah. So incrementally, this is not there. True. So now, yeah. will it be virtual? Sure. That's the question. Yeah. Okay. Good. So let's start from there. So this is exactly what was my question to you guys framed for today. Fine. So we had uh, assumed this was open circuited initially, then we close the loop. I assume you all of you are uh, we are you, you are uh, comfortable with the idea that this is a unity gain buffer, right? Okay. So assume that you have very high gain in open loop, right? GMR naught is very high. So if this is VB, what is this supposed to be? VB, right? So this is V naught is supposed to be VB. Okay. So now assume that I change this VB by delta V. What will happen to this output? Should change by delta V. Good. So if this changes by delta V, initially let's assume this voltage was Vx naught. What will happen to this voltage after change? Will it remain at Vx naught after I applied extra delta V on Vb? Pardon? Which means it will be delta V, right? So it will increase by delta V. So it's naturally you see that it's not a virtual short anymore. So is that surprising? Is it is it something you expect? Don't expect? The question is, I mean, I applied delta V here. So what happens to this node? Well, don't go into definition. I mean, okay, he's, his question was, if I had this, I mean, normally we do what? You apply V1 here, minus V1 here, then this becomes virtual short. Okay. Incrementally rounded, right? So in a feedback mode, is that incrementally rounded? So clearly you see that it's not. So why? Is that surprising? Is it something you expect? 
some voodoo is happening whatever we discussed for last five weeks is wrong not symmetric i didn't understand okay so it's not it doesn't look symmetric that's fine so how, what has that to do with that it was not symmetric earlier also right in the in a, we are neglecting GDS here also. Sir, here a different thing is happening. Like in this case, because of the diode connected of M2, the earlier case when it was not connected, there was a RDS was there. Okay. okay. And for M1, RDS was there. Okay. But in this case, M1 of RDS is present, but the for M2. No, no, assume RDS to be infinity. RDS to be infinity. Yeah. GDS zero, ideal case. No, no, I'm not asking you the problem. I'm asking, I mean, the question that he started off with was when I, under this configuration, will the VX node move or not move? It looks like it will not move, but is this something that you would expect before you saw this, or this is something that you don't expect? If you expect, then I'll just move on. It's not a problem. If you don't expect, I would like to explain. So that's, the, that's why I'm asking. So if this is obvious, I don't need to explain. That's the only question. If it's obvious, I'll just move on. Exactly, right? So, so, so the, I mean, exactly what she's saying is to balance the current, it has to be equal to extra, it has to move. And this is, note that even though this is a differential amplifier and put in negative feedback, when it's in negative feedback, you have virtual shorts between these two nodes. You have virtual shorts between these two nodes, which means that in a sense, both the terminals are moving up and down in emission. It's like a common mode case, right? So when you do the analysis of it, uh, of your common mode uh, stuff, right? Whatever you, whatever analysis you do, that is valid here because of this input being tied together. It's not physically tied together because of the negative feedback action of DFAM. These two are getting tied together and they are moving in emission. Okay, so that is why that is another way of thinking. You will not have a current split between arms. Too much of current split between arms. Initially, if this was I naught, this was I naught by two, this was also I naught by two. So if you have infinite open loop gain, after this, after connecting in negative feedback also, both the arms will have I naught by two current. Okay. If you assume that there is a slight amount of different, slightly different current, then that different current has to flow into an infinite load. If you are assuming that RDS is infinite, which is not allowed, right? Because I mean, if it goes into an infinite load, you will have infinite voltage, which means these two are no longer virtual shots. Inputs are no longer virtual shots. Okay. So essentially the difference, very high differential gain of the op amp in negative feedback is, is forcing the, Currents to be identical on both arms. Okay, so it's almost like a very high differential gain of the, of the op amp is ensuring that all the analysis you do for common mode is still valid. Okay, makes sense. Current discharge on the both the arm will be same. Right? Yeah. If M1 and M2 are ideal in that case, and even if they are not ideal, in if they are not ideal, there will be some difference, right? Because See, ultimately, what is negative feedback doing? It's trying to minimize the error. It's been trying to minimize the error between the gate of M1 and M2. Okay. So now, how does it minimize the error? If there is an error, it has to push in current in the appropriate direction. If M2 is, if, if the gate of M2 is slightly lower, that is, output voltage is slightly lower, it has to push in more current. And it has to hope that it has high output voltage. I mean, it, I mean, in open loop sense, it has high output impedance. So small amount of current, if I push in, it will be able to mitigate that error. So that's why in other, in other sense, you require high gain, right? Because high gain is what you have, small amount of current can cause a lot of change in voltage. If small amount of current causes a lot of change in voltage, which means that if I want a finite amount of voltage change, a very incremental amount change in current will, will, will suffice. And which means if the gain is infinite, almost no current change is required. So your bias conditions remains the same. Correct. This is after everything settles. Correct. Yes. 
yes feedback is for bias and for signal both right so there is no difference right i mean if you if you are comfortable with the idea that i am at apply delta v here this also goes by delta v now delta v can be delta v of t it can be a time dependent delta v delta v can be vp sin omega t yeah ideally i would like to set i mean the we are building negative feedback to ensure that my incremental gain doesn't change right incremental gain is r1 minus r1 by r2 in the example that i showed just before. so if r1 and r2 are of similar types then it will not change it's not dependent on any of the transistor parameters which means it's stable so which essentially means that we want that is my expectation but in order to reach there i have to use active circuits now active circuits need to be biased so we need to ensure that the active circuits are also biased using negative feedback so this is one of the collateral things that is happening that our negative feedback is uh, biasing setting up the bias both for my sorry negative feedback is setting up both the bias and is also helping us to to get uh, to apply incremental input and get what we desire okay so in this case it's not r1 by r2 it's basically one right so you're, it's like a buffer it doesn't matter what you connect here it will still be one because as long as your open loop gain is high this is non-inverting case. Non case. Okay, fine. So let's go to the uh, to the cascaded configuration that we were discussing. So we we know how to bias this M5, M6 thing, right? So through. Through a couple of current sources. <coughs> this we have discussed extensively white swing color mirrors. And note that this is also connected in a negative feedback. Any unit again configuration. So I need to figure out now what is this this voltage, right? This cascode voltage of M7 M8. So let's assume that this is connected to VB. This is V naught. Okay. So now tell me, uh, I mean, okay, I mean, let's go step by step. How, if everything is working properly, what do you expect the maximum V naught? I mean, what do you expect this voltage to be at max? Okay, that is correct. It's supposed to be VB, but is there an upper limit with respect to if I am only concerned about M4, M6 getting into saturation or getting out of saturation, what is the upper limit of that node that, that it can go? So this should this can go to VDD minus two overdrive, right? So this V naught max under the condition of M5, M4, M6 being in saturation, right? So this is under the condition of M4, M6 in saturation is VDD minus two V overdrive. Okay. So if uh, let's take numbers, let's assume VDD equal to one point eight. Threshold voltage of all transistors is let's say 0.5 volt. And let's assume we had biased all transistors with overdrive of 100 millivolt. So this can go to 1.6 volts max, right? This is under the condition that M6, M4 are 
both in saturation. But we have so many other transistors also, we'll have to take care of that. So, but let's do one step at a time. So, what is the minimum V0 can go? How would you ensure that? Okay. Okay. So, that is right. But what about the condition on M8? You want M8 to be also in saturation. So, what determines that M8 is always in saturation? VN. VN CAS, right? So, your VN CAS ha always has to be has to be what? Greater than, less than what? Less than. Less than what? V out minus plus plus VQ, right? So this ensures this ensures what this is for M8 in saturation. Okay. So now the question boils down to how do I figure out what is VN CAS voltage? I know how to figure out the PMOS side voltages because wide swing current meter and all those things we have done. But this I have to figure out how do I how do I ensure that VN CAS is always in uh, always in saturation. So so then what sets the limit max limit on VN CAS? Is it the maximum side of V naught or minimum side of V naught? Minimum side of V naught. So if I can figure out what is the minimum allowed V naught, then I can figure out what is the minimum VN CAS, right? So what is the minimum allowed V naught? Pardon, I didn't hear you. Okay, you have one overdrive here. So let's say, let's say 100 millivolt. Then, then one VGS. One VGS is th threshold voltage plus overdrive. Threshold voltage we have taken to be 0.5. Uh, overdrive is 100 millivolt. So this will be 700 millivolt. Correct? So V naught min is 700 millivolt. Right? So V naught mean, let me write it properly. If this is M0, this is M0, V overdrive of M0 plus VGS of M2, which is 700 millivolt. Okay. So if V naught is minimum is 700 millivolt, what will be the uh, minimum voltage on VN CAS? V on CAS has to be less than 700 plus. Threshold voltage is 500 millivolt. That is 1.2 volt. Okay, so this has to be, let's keep it at the edge, 1.2 volt. At the lower edge, right? So with this, you can get the maximum amount of swing at V naught. So if you say that I don't want to keep it at the edge, maybe I want to push it by 100 millivolt, or maybe a BN CAS is, uh, I want to keep it at 1.3 volt. What are you sacrificing? Swing at V naught, okay? So now the question, my question to you is that uh, this is all good, but what happens if I, if I have a signal swing here, I expect the signal swing at V naught also, then will this, Will it be a problem on uh, on VN CAS? I mean, I, if I keep it at 1.2 volt at the edge, right? So, and now I am, uh, my input is, okay, by the way, now the next question, I, 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 I jumped ahead. So, so the maximum of V0, V0 max is 1.6. And so V naught, let me rewrite it. V naught is less than 1.6 and greater than what? 700 millivolt, right? 0.7 volt. So if V naught goes to 1.6, is, is V naught 1.6 allowed? I took, took out the, I mean, I said that V naught max is 1.6 under certain condition, under the condition of M4, M6 to be in saturation. But that's not the only con condition I should be, I should be concerned about. So V naught under this configuration, V naught going to 1.6 means what? Your input of M1 also has gone to 1.6 because they are following each other. So is, is, 
input of m1 going to 1.6 allowed in this configuration why not so what is the max which essentially i'm asked what essentially i'm asking is under this configuration what is the max vb okay so can you uh, instead of giving the answer can you just walk me through the thought process that will be more. Huh, okay so you are saying that if this increases you you should be concerned about uh, m1 going out of triode okay that's right and and you are saying something uh, swing at this node right swing at the drain of m1 i should be concerned about my question is will the drain at m1 swing when the input swings Is the question clear? So my input is swinging. Let's say my input is swinging. Do you expect, if you probe this node, do you expect to the first order, do you expect it to swing? It will not swing, right? So because what we, I mean, the five minutes back, we are discussing with the fact that if everything is balanced, your current is always I naught by two. There is no incremental current per se. Since there is no incremental current, when it's, I mean, you can always say why there is no incremental current. There is this, always a small incremental current, and that is because you don't have infinite gain. But to the first order, the zeroth order, there is whatever current was flowing through each of the stack, is, it was I naught by two, it is still I naught by two. Maybe I naught by two plus some small delta. But as for that delta is not significant enough to make a dent, I mean, to, to change the voltage at this node, because that anyway is a low impedance node. Okay. So this voltage will stay at what? Whatever it was biased at, right? So what was it biased at? How do you figure what is the quiescent bias of that node? So it's 1.2 minus VGS of Correct, right? So which is equal to what? VGS plus VOD. No, value, value. So 1.2 minus VGS which is equal to VGS is 600 millivolt. So this is 600 millivolt. Right? Okay. So if that is 600 millivolt, which means what can be the maximum VB? Under this condition, VB max un under the condition of M1 is always in saturation, right? 600 plus VTH. 600 plus VTH, which is one volt, right? So, so let me write it here. V0 max is equal to VB max. And under the condition of M1 in SAT will be equal to 600 plus 0.5, that is 1.1 volt. Okay, so it's not 1.6 anymore. Why is it not 1.6 anymore? Because it's not being limited by M4, M6. Some other transistor is getting out of saturation if you go beyond beyond 1.1. Okay, so this is why circuit design is is a multi, I mean is a very interesting thing, right? You try to solve. You are probably uh, focusing on something, but something else also is changing, right? So you have to be you have to be aware that what is changing where. And things that's why I said yesterday there, there was this question in the last class there was this question that should I do the design in an open loop fashion and then put negative feedback or should I do the design in negative feedback and then analyze. So this is one of the reasons you have to do the design in negative feedback and then analyze. Because if you do it in open loop fashion, you will conclude that V0 max is 1.6 volt. Because V0 and VB are not tied together in open loop. In closed loop, V0 and VB are tied together which means there is a separate uh, constraint that V0 has to adhere to. And that is good in a way in the sense that now you are relaxed while sizing these M3, M4, M5, M6 transistors. Because you know V0 cannot reach 1.6 volt. Right? That is, I mean, it's not allowed by some part of the circuit that your V0 cannot reach 1.6 volt. So you don't have to really, I mean, focus on optimizing the last millivolt out of M5, M6. 
you can be i mean you can relax okay so so again note that this is a particular example that i took for this particular configuration under unity and feedback if something changes all of these things all of these conclusions change this is not a one i mean one size fits all solution that is why analog circuit is very interesting right you 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 have to figure out a solution for each circuit that you are trying to uh, uh, trying to analyze but what i am trying to get at here is to show you the thought process of how to figure out what limits what and what are the knobs that you can turn okay so depending on the type of feedback uh, for example the range of delay is changing right, right? yes so, sir, whenever some property is specifying that data sheet how they specify the they will tell you under what feedback condition you have to read it carefully uh, they will tell you it's stable this much uh, this is the stability margins and so on under what feedback condition typically it's unity feedback so from there you will have to figure out if i use it in some other configuration where how will it get affected that's up to the design customer okay fine any questions before we move yeah yes so is there a general line that after closing the loop, the loop will always like no, there is nothing general. It can remain the same also, right? I mean, it depends on what circuit you are operating. So here it's not. I mean, you, I, I can always say that. Um, let's say I. So this will. I mean, since you have more room to go on M4, M6, I can say I will put another test code between M3 and M4. I can also put because I am not limited by the headroom on top. So, depending on the correct, depending on the configuration, right? So that's why general purpose op amps are slightly tricky because general purpose op amps means that under these specific conditions it will work accordingly. But in in IC design, you don't make really the general purpose op amp. You are making a op amp uh, or you are making whatever diff amp for a particular spec that has been given to you. So that's why it's custom IC design. So you don't really make general purpose stuff when you are making. So these are all internal to your chip. Maybe it's it's interfacing between one block to another. So your your this uh, this block has to adhere to the specifications of those two blocks with which it is talking. To. So it need not be general purpose at all. If that block satisfies these swing limits, fine. If not, then move on to something else and see some other architecture. Okay, fine. Uh, so the other, so now we have been dealing with this uh, uh, DC uh, DC stuff for a, quite a while now. So, but we all know that uh, there are capacitances associated with uh, all my all my transistors, right? So generally, you have a transistor. I think I talked about some of these capacitances one of the other lectures. But in general, you have a capacitance between gate and source. Yes. yes. Right. And it it is needed to tell that at in the closing point. That is the final goal, right? You you will never design open loop amplifier and hope that it will be used in open loop. It's always used in closed loop. High gain amplifier is always used in closed loop. So you need to know what you are, what will be the closed loop configuration. In closure, uh, I mean, gate that is just a representative. That's a representative diagram. Huh. Yeah, so you can have cascode there. So 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 whatever I have put put in that project, it's a, only a representation. Right, so you you might have to change things. So, spoiler alert: you have to change things. <laughs> okay, so that's why it's at the tag end of the course, right? Not like within two weeks. So you have to bring in all the knowledge that you have gathered, hopefully, uh, to meet the specs. Okay, actually, uh, the designer said, "I have to open the gain of this." 
Oh, by the way, I mean, Swati, it's not as if I'm saying that you have to put a CAS code at the tail, right? So it's up to you, right? So you might or might not, but you have to see what else needs to be changed. But yeah. So design of the town is my game simple. Okay. We design is from WMS this year. Right. But we are seeing that after closing this loop, all the transistors are away from the right. and all the things. Right. So that's why I said you don't design using closed loop. You design using open loop. You sorry, you design you don't design using open loop. You design use closed loop with. I mean, you remember what we talked about last class. You put inductors, capacitors to set the bias, and then from there you can get the open loop gain also, right? Okay. So designing by the closed loop, I remember saying that this is. Yeah, yeah. From the same test bench, you can get open loop gain also. So that's the whole idea of it. So this is a very common mistake that students do, or even not only students, people who in, in many industries also who have limited experience initially in initial parts of the career, the design, even I used to do when, when I went to the industry for the first time. So I used to op design opens in open loop, put in closed close loop and think that nothing is working, not my fault. Right? So, so, but that's not how it is. You have to understand what you are designing it for. Okay, fine. So, uh, uh, so let's go to the next part of of the course. So now, uh, if this is a I mean, it's an NMOS. So you have typically a body connection here. I haven't talked about body biases. I will talk about it later, but let's assume that the source and the body are connected together. And they're connected to ground, for example. This is N plus, N plus. So now if, when, when, if, let's assume you have just turned it on and drain is also at ground. If you assume drain it as ground, drain also is at ground and your you have applied a gate voltage which is above threshold voltage then it will induce a, a negative charge right it will induce a negative charge here and that forms a channel so this this capacitance here that you will see between the gate and the source is cgs or which is equal to CGD. And now when we say CGS equal to CGD, we, we divide it into, so essentially what we are saying is we are dividing this channel into two parts. One that is connected towards the source, another that is connected towards the drain. Because we have access to the terminals of source gate and drain. Generally, we don't tap anything from middle of the channel, right? That we don't have access to that terminal. So essentially what we are saying is that whatever distributed capacitance I will have in the channel, I will lump it half towards the source. I mean, some part towards the source and some parts towards the towards the drain. So, which means that I mean, my source to drain and gate to drain capacitance will be identical, and that will be equal to half of whatever the channel capacitance was, and that is C ox times W times L. C ox is epsilon ox by T ox, right? C ox is unit capacitance that is epsilon ox by T ox. Okay. So. There is one more, there is additional capacitance associated with this. And that is the fact that even if you don't have channel, if you zoom in here, you will see there is a, there is overlap here. Because of that overlap, there will be a typical, I mean, it's basically a classic, a classic uh, parallel plate capacitor. And there will be a capacitance associated with it. So that will be C overlap capacitance. So this is typically CGD overlap or C, 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 CGS overlap, whatever you want to call it. Typically, it's called CGD overlap. So uh, this you will have this uh, total capacity. Uh, the total capacitance will be this. But as it turns out, when it's in this, uh, by the way, this uh, this channel configuration that I have shown, it is it more towards linear or saturation? It's since no right. Why saturation? Linear. It's more towards inclined towards linear region, right? Because the channel is symmetric, right? Which means that there is no difference between drain and source voltage, which means it's towards towards 
Pardon? Drain is grounded, yeah. In this case, I have also shown drain is grounded, right? So that that essentially is uh, seals it, right? So uh, so as it turns out, your CGD overlap will is often much smaller than uh, than this uh, diffusion capacitance per se, right? So uh, sorry, I take my word back. This is not called diffusion capacitance. This is the capacitance channel capacitance. Okay, so uh, now when you increase the drain voltage, when you increase the drain voltage, what happens? This you you lose the symmetry of the channel. Let's say drain is now connected to some voltage which is higher than zero. And gate obviously is at higher than zero because you want inversion. So the symmetry of the channel is lost and you kind of get this type of, start to get this, I mean, triangular type of shape simply because if drain is at higher voltage, you see that the effective channel, the effective voltage between the gate and the channel is has reduced because you have increased the drain voltage and more you go towards the drain that, uh, that differential reduces. So the amount of charge that you can sustain under that small sliver also reduces. And that is why you get smaller, uh, that is why you get a smaller distribution of charge towards the drain than towards the source. Now, if that is the case, then obviously the capacitance expressions are no longer valid as is. Since this, uh, so under these conditions, under pinch of conditions, so what we tend to do, we will say we we'll just take the center of gravity of this uh, of this charge and see which side is higher, right? So it looks like you have more charge towards the towards the source than towards the drain. And if you do some calculation, as it turns out, it CGS then becomes two third C ox W by L, W times L. But this CGD overlap remains. That is a physical capacitance, right? And the CGD only become CGD overlap. By the way, the CGD overlap is a nomen nomenclature. It's actually, ideally should be CGS overlap, but since it's symmetric with respect to uh, both sides, we call it CGD overlap. Or you can simply call it overlap capacitance also. Some places call it that, that's also fine. Okay, so now, uh, now, these are the two dom two of the very uh, dominant capacitances that you find in uh, in MOSFETs. The other capacitance that is dominant is we have this drain and uh, body junction, which is also a reverse bias diode. So you'll have a capacitance there, and this is CDB. Okay. What about the source and body? Why not? Because they are shorted, right? So even though there is a physical capacitance between here to there, but you don't really care because they are shorted through something else. Okay, so we don't really consider that. So it, so in essence, in our transistor model, in our transistor model, this, the capacitance that we are concerned about are CGS, CGD, CDB. Okay, this is typically because we are considering this configuration. Okay, where the body is shorted to the source. Any questions? No, no, no. So, so I have seen, I am connecting it because I have not yet talked about body effect. So generally, uh, so when you connect body to the source, you are assuming that the body is also moving. If the source is not connected to the ground, the source can be of any voltage, which means the body can, you are assuming that the body can also be of any voltage, right? So, but in whatever we have drawn here, what is body? Body is common for all NMOSs, right? So I can have another NMOS next to it. Is a body is a common substrate. So generally in many, uh, in most PDKs, in fact, the, you don't have the luxury of connecting a separate body for a 
so basically what i'm saying is that you cannot have an inmos which which is body is uh, anything other than ground so generally in most most pdks it's the case but there are some pdks which allow you to have a different body so in that case you will have to make a separate well for an nmos okay so just like a pmos it's sitting under a separate well in nmos you have to make another separate well so as to say that its body is of, uh, of uh, it can be non ground voltage okay you had a question yeah i think this all this configuration where we have this current meter uh, normal current meter this body effect will not be visible but in the cascode we really have this body effect yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so i'll come to that later right so uh, that that is no, that is sometimes a problem but it's not as much a problem that we think right so that's why i have kept it to the last part the simulation in your simulated body is for your project no but for the simulation assignment that you did last time yeah you can do that i mean i think i also said that you can do that for everything yeah body has to be either connected to ground or to vdd for pmos pmos body you can connect to the source because all pmoses have a separate well right so since so you can have the pmos body connected to the to the um, uh, to the source but not the nmos so the only thing is that threshold voltage changes by some amount right so so that's not too much of a concern okay fine so so now the question is fine so we have this capacitance here so what's the issue let it be so the issue is the following <coughs> Let me take you back to our feedback system. So this is the capacitance that we had. This is the intended capacitance that we had, right? Because we wanted some GMT by C. Right? So let's see if this is. Now note that this is I mean, this GMVE whatever we are uh, we are showing here is now uh, we know that this is essentially a DFAM. It can be a common source amplifier also, but we, since we have done DFAM, let's assume that's a DFAM. So if if it's a DFAM, I can replace this stuff and say that this is. Okay, so now you have in a DFAM here you have, let me draw this GM to be a bit larger that will help make the point. So what do you have in a DFAM? In a DFAM you have two terminals where you have one capacity, one, in C, one mouse connected to one, another mouse connected to there. At the output also you have some stops connected so which essentially means that you have a capacitance associated with these nodes okay fine so you'll have to be then which which essentially means that we'll have to take into take these capacitances into account also what is happening to our loop gain we initially only dealt with only one capacitor but now we have one, several capacitances so the fortunately we can lump many of these capacitors to one and then go ahead and do our calculations also so what i mean by that is when we do loop gain analysis what do we do we break the loop okay so we break the loop if we break the loop here and then we try to figure out what is the input impedance here initially it was like infinite because we had only gate without any capacitance but clearly it's not anymore so you will have some equivalent capacitance so let me call i'm not getting into how you found out the equivalent capacitance but let's assume we have found out equivalent capacitance 
So which means what? I'll have to replace that if, you, if, I, if I apply my test voltage here to figure out, so I ground this. I applied my test voltage here and I'll see my return voltage here, okay? Which means I'll have to figure out what is, I'm sorry, which means I'll have to, uh, in order to figure out what is V return by VTS accurately, I'll have to ensure that the loading effects also is taken into account, which means whatever impedance I was seeing here earlier needs to be translated back, which means that equivalent capacitance has to be brought in here, whatever is a C in. Okay. So now if you have this to be the GM and this is whatever you, whatever it is. So what is your, what does your loop gain look like? Or rather, what is the expression of loop gain? Find out the expression of loop gain and tell me. Okay, so I assume that all of you have got a second order expression at least, right? So if it's a second order expression, I can express it in the form of L of S to be equal to some A naught by one plus S by P1 minus one plus S by P2. Fine, this can be done. Okay, so what will be A naught? What is the DCN? So what is DCN? GM tens, uh, uh, GMR tens K. Uh, how do you figure out DCN? Is basically you, you, yeah, so GMR, right? So exactly, right? You open the capacitance and you apply V test. The current that is flowing in is GM times V test. And whatever you find out, it goes and uh, hits you at R. So your, your, this thing is GMR, right? So N0 becomes GMR. So, so the question is, uh, the question is, Ideally, what do you expect this to uh, look like? In other words, what I'm saying is, if you didn't have this C in, okay, if you didn't have this C in, you would have gotten a DCN. So without C in, this is without C in. You would have got a DCN, which is equal to GMR. Right, then, then you would have, you would have hit a pole, and where would that pole be? You don't have C in, so it's basically one capacitor, one one I mean one particular lump resistor in in parallel, right? So you'll have a pole. Let me call this some P naught, and after that you would have done this. Okay. What would this slope be? What would have been the expression for this slope? Minus Correct. It's minus 20 degree per decade, but if I have to figure out what is the expression, what do you, what do you think the expression will be? No scene. Expected expression. I'm not saying exact expression. What is the, what do you, as a designer, you should know what you are expecting. So what is an expected expression for this? Uh, no, not. So there should be a capacitance effect, right? Because that's how, that's why you are having. So, so we taking into something, right? What is, okay, what is that minus 20 log of what? Don't have to get into log domain also in, If you're unsure, you can figure out, I mean, this is not, this is not I mean, difficult, right? You would neglect C in and find out what will be the slope and what will be the expression. Okay, so let me give you the answer. So, so essentially, if you neglect C in, you only have this capacity, if you neglect C in, if you only have this load, 
what is happening after p not what is happening essentially what is what is trying to happen after p not your capacitance is dominating that's why capacitance is stealing all the charge right so which means that all the current that is flowing here flowing out is going into the capacitor which means your voltage at that this node will be gm by sc and this voltage will be gm by ksc right so this ideally this expected slope will be gm by k s k c this is expected right this is expected now what has this addition of this extra p2 done is that this will no we know we will understand that this will no longer be a uh, 20 db per decade slope after some time wherever i mean after some frequency it will be 40 db per decade and also this p not need not necessarily be equal to p1 right even though mathematically that is strictly true but if you assume if you assume that uh, the value of c is much higher than c in which essentially means that the capacitance c is starting to load first then the dominant pole of c will i mean then you can assume that p1 is almost equal to p naught so this can this statement can be confusing let me rephrase so let's assume you have this ladder so, so this is slope or this is the expression the slope will be gm by kc uh -huh. okay. so let's assume you have a ladder r c1 another r c2 okay so and let's assume uh, okay so, so let me assume this also to make the point let me say that this is 100 r and this is c1 by 100 okay this is v vi this is v naught your exact expression will be will be a bit messy but can i make it simpler what i am saying is that if you if you look at can i say that v naught over vi is equal to 1 over 1 by s plus p1 1 plus s by p2 where p1 is 1 by rc1 and p2 or let me call this is c2 this is c2 is much much greater than c1 and this is r2 which is much much greater than r p2 is equal to 1 by r2 c2 can i say this why can i say this because the impedance in this point is very high so current will be yeah yeah right so so essentially what i am saying is that if you look at, look here the impedance seen by this part of the circuit is much higher with respect to the left part of the circuit so the current would so essentially at at moderate frequencies the current would prefer to go into c1 rather than go into r2 right so whatever current that is coming through here dominant one will try to flow into c1 and not into the other side because the impedance looking at the right hand side is much higher than the impedance looking below once at, once you reach this node right so current always tries to take the least resistance path i mean so as we so uh, so so something similar can be argued here okay so if c is much greater than c in right so the first pole will be dominated by by the node uh, when you hit this node okay so uh, again i mean this is take home for you uh, do this exact expression and figure out under what condition i can express the loop gain in this form what is the condition between c and c in so you will find an expression you can take k to be 2 right take k to be 2 and then then see under what condition uh, you can uh, you you get this assumption so the key uh, what i am trying to get at here is that if if you assume p not is almost equal to p1 then the first pole didn't change but a second pole came in and second pole will be at some other frequency so the second pole can be here can be here whatever if it's here you will start having 40 db per decade roll up here 
okay so then does all the omega u loop time constant thing that we did long time back all this still hold because those were strictly true for first order systems now we have second order systems or higher order systems because it's not necessarily you will have only one extra capacitance you can have like 10 20 extra capacitances okay then what do you do you cannot be sitting and writing polynomial equations i mean that's not even possible analytically so those are the things that we will look into from the next class okay okay yes 